himself with flesh and dwelt amongst men. The God who suffered and died a death that was ours to die. He took a penalty that was ours to take. And he took the burden of our sin upon himself. For that we are deeply grateful. Amen. We are deeply grateful. And that's why we're here tonight, church. We're here to worship a God that loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son for us that he may die on our behalf. Amen. So if we're seeking revival, we need to seek him. He needs to become the center most important part of our lives. Amen. Listen, we've uh, got Brother Johnny with us one more night here tonight, and I know most of you know him, uh, but for you that do not know him, uh, Brother Johnny has been in the ministry for over 50 years, has been serving the Lord faithfully for over 50 years. Started when he was at the age of 15 years old. That's almost unheard of, especially in this day and time. But God has used him in, a, in big, mighty ways, in my opinion. He's been a great example for myself, for my family. And we just uh, we just are deeply grateful that he's here with us tonight and has been with us here for the past three days and will be here with us tomorrow. So uh, let's welcome Brother Johnny with us tonight. He's 68 years old, old and decrepit, without learning some things in life. And I have been preaching for 53 years. And so I've, I've been in a lot of situations and a lot of circumstances. And I've observed, thank you, Brother Cowboy, I've observed a lot of things. And one of the things that I've observed is to know God's in charge. Did y'all know that? He's not in charge. If, Brother Wayne, he's in charge. He's one of the children. Now, sometimes I'd kind of like to tell God how to run things. You ever been that way? You know, like Job did. But I want to say to you tonight, listen to this. Please hear this. There is a divine purpose in your being here. And, and hear these two things I'm going to say. Number one, it's not difficult for God to get your attention. When you're talking about the one that spoke the world into existence. He's the one that put the electron and the proton and the neutron together to formulate the cells that make up our bodies. He's the one that determines that our bodies replenish these cells by the millions, month after month after month. It is not difficult for the God that is in charge of all of this to get your attention. However, Aren't you thankful that the first option he gives you is this? Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Thank God for that. I am thankful, Brother Randy, that before God starts saying, hey, you want me to chase you to get you where I want you to be? You want me on your backside? I can do that and I will do that because I love you. But the first option is this. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Now, God wouldn't tell us to do that if we couldn't. You say, but Brother Johnny, uh, my, I, I'm such a prideful person. But look, remember this. God knows that. And He said to you, humble yourself. But look at it. everybody in here. I don't preach like I do because I'm scared to death God can't get your attention. Don't want you to misunderstand that. The message that we preach is not... We're not trying to proclaim a gospel from a God that's doing His best to be in charge. He is in charge. He's not trying anything. God never has said, uh-oh, or oops. The Bible says that He does the good pleasure of His own will. And please listen to this tonight. If God spoke to you, if He's speaking to you about doing something, why don't you just go ahead and do it? Why don't you wait around to have an encounter with God that you flatter your back saying, why? And God has to go back about six years and say, you remember what I was speaking to you about that night? And you were rebellious and you thought you was going to handle it? You didn't listen? Now, I've got you in a place now that you're willing to listen, period, whatever. Don't let that happen to you. Please don't let that happen to you. Just right now. And you don't have to wait. Somebody said last night, I wanted to come far before the invitation was given. But we don't give the invitation. He does. And if you get ready to come tonight and make a decision while I'm preaching, help yourself. Just come on. And so I'm going to challenge you tonight. If you hear his voice, 
The scripture says, harden not your heart. All right. Turn back with us again to the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28, 29, and 30. Somebody said, well, Brother Johnny, when are you going to go to another scripture when we get through with this one? <laughs> the black pastor went to the church and uh, he preached on tithe on Sunday morning. He preached on tithe on Sunday night. He preached on tithe on Wednesday night. The next Sunday morning he preached on tithe and the next Sunday night he preached on tithe and the next Wednesday night he preached on tithe and in about six weeks in a row the deacons met with, you know, deacons do that some kind of other way. And they said, Pastor, when are you going to start preaching something else? He said, when y'all start doing what I've already preached to you. <laughs> so I'm going to deal with Matthew chapter 11, 28, 29, and 30. Probably even through tomorrow night. By the way, tomorrow night's youth night. We can pray about that. Wouldn't it be amazing? Listen, do you realize what it is for God to have somebody like Cowboy in your presence, a young guy that the Lord's put his hand on while he's young to send him out to preach the gospel? Don't take that for granted. And, and it wasn't a big deal. I was just an average guy, 15-year-old boy. Honestly, I was a nobody. Still am. And, and, and did you know that God just might want to save one of these young people tomorrow night and make him the next Billy Graham? Yes. Did you know that about 38 years ago I was sitting in a, a in a woman's home in South Carolina and I was eating at her dining room table and she said, Brother Johnny, do you know who sat there? Maybe not in that same chair, but in that same place when he was a student at the university as a 19-year-old boy. I said, oh no, I thought it might have been Led Zipplin or whoever, I didn't know. And she, you know what she said? She said, Dr. Billy Graham. She said, if you would told me that I would be entertaining a man like Billy Graham in my home when he was a 19-year-old boy, I would have said, that's impossible. You don't know who God's gonna bring here tomorrow night or tonight. You have no idea when Holy God gets a hold of a life, He is unlimited in what He can do. Do you, do you remember the day? Do you remember the day that the man of God decided he was going to do it on his own? And he wasn't listening and God said, don't you go there. And he said, oh yes I am. And he got on a donkey. You remember that? And when he got to that crevice in that rock and was going to go through that mountain, the donkey balked and stopped. And he got up and hit the donkey up beside the head, something I probably would do. And then he tried again. He said, we're going through that hole in that rock. And this time the Bible said that the donkey rubbed up against the rock wall. And the man jumped off and hit the donkey again. And the third time the prophet, the man of God, was determined to do what God told him not to do. And he started through the opening in that mountain the third time and the donkey fell on his knees. And the guy got up, and the preacher again was going to beat the donkey. And listen to this. The Bible said the donkey turned and said, you knucklehead. He didn't say knucklehead. That's Johnny's interpretation. <laughs> but he said, you knucklehead, if you will look right over that rock ledge, there is an angel there with a sword drawn, and if I hadn't stopped, he would have cut your head off. Now, if God can speak to a donkey, don't you tell me God couldn't bring one of these young people in here tomorrow night and make an incredible missionary preacher or, or Sunday school teacher out of them. So you pray about that, okay? Now, I'm not preaching yet, so don't start timing me. I'm just talking. Could I just give a word of testimony? Uh, because of my heart, my, I don't know if you know this, but my heart's been pumping at 18% for the last 15 years and about... Uh, probably about May the 15th I, my heart started not doing real well because the heat affects me and then a lot of things were going on I had to do some work in the sun then I went to Guatemala and I will testify that today I feel like the old John is going to preach two hours to like you know I'm teasing I ain't preaching two hours but I, I'm, I, I'm just thankful I feel good. This first day I felt good in about six weeks. I mean that. And I'm not saying that for any reason other than to say, bless his name. I'm so grateful for that. All right. Chapter 11 of the book of Matthew in verses 28, 29, and 30. Come unto me. I want to emphasize this again. I know I preached it Sunday morning and I know I made reference to it last night. Come unto me. If you've got a problem, go to him. You got a problem go to him something going on in your life go to him 
I'm going to tell you why in just a little while, but I'm just telling you right off the bat. Anything going on, go to him. There is not one issue in your life that you face that he can't handle. And I'll tell you something else. There's not one issue in your life that he's not interested in. Did you know he cares about every aspect of your life? Did you know there's not one thing that's going on in your life that doesn't captivate the heart of God? Do you remember when the Bible said God created everything for the first five days? He created the earth and all the... And looked around us at this incredible beauty. And every time God did it, the Bible says God looked at it and said it's good. But on the sixth day, He created man. And then the Bible said He observed it and said it's very good. Well, that's God's opinion of you. You look at the majesty of the mountains. Have you ever been to the Grand Canyon, a ditch 15 miles wide? Wow. You ever seen Niagara Falls? God has done some incredible things. And yet, after He made you and me, He observed us and said, that is very good. That's amazing. That's what God thinks about us. And so I want you to know tonight, if you're having any struggle, He's the one that puts you together. He knows you. By the way, sometimes when you look at people you don't like the personality, you might better be careful. You, you might be dealing with the one that gave them that personality. So don't, don't fuss at them. You know, God knows what He's doing. Seven and a half billion people in the world, not a single one of them got the same thumbprint. We think God looked one day and said, Gee whiz, I didn't know that was going to happen. Of course He did. It's His divine plan to make every one of us different. You don't want everybody to act like you. You know, one of the most profound things that my sweet wife has ever said to me after we've been married about 15 years, she looked at me and said, Johnny, I am not supposed to be Johnny Tucker number two. And I said, what do you mean? She said, since the day we married, you've been trying to make me another one of you. And I got to thinking, I don't want to be married to somebody that don't shave up under their arms. I don't want to be married to somebody that don't shave their legs. I don't want to be married to somebody. Can you imagine a cowboy being married to somebody that looks like you? That's <laughs> crazy. And God smote my heart. I've been trying to make Judy out to be me. How dumb. I was wanting to violate everything I saw in her that was precious, Brother Randy. I was trying to change that. But God said, if you're having a conflict, He's the one that made you. He knows about it. And He said, come to me. So He said, come to me. Who? Doesn't matter what color you are. Doesn't matter what nation you're from. The Bible doesn't say, for God so loved the United States of America. For God so loved the world. When He gave us that scripture, the United States was not in existence. We're only 200 years old. There are some nations 4,000 years old. So we dare not think we've got a special place in the heart of God. He said, come unto me all. That's everybody. That's why no matter where I am, no matter what ages they are or what they've done, I can say Jesus gives you that invitation to come in. Come to me, all you that labor and you hate to labor. Now, why do you say that? Now, you can smile and make everybody think everything is so wonderful, but we know what's going on in your heart. You can't fool us. You know how we know? Because we're a human being just like you are. We have hurts and pains and struggles and difficulties and anger and frustration, and we sometimes have to deal with hatred and untruthfulness, just like you do. So don't be bent out of shape because you've got to try to hide everything. We know because we're a human being just like you are. We know you have conflict. Somebody said, well, my wife and I have been married for 20 years. We've never had an argument. You're a liar. That's all i got to say, baby. <laughs> You're the biggest wimp that's ever lived. You hear me? Yeah, You've been living with a woman 20 years and ain't fussed. Something bad wrong with you. You hear me? But the Bible says, coming to me, all you that labor in heavy labor. Why do he say that? Because he knows that we labor in our heavy labor. Say, but Brother Johnny, you just don't know how many conflicts we've had. Yes, we do. Been there and done that. daughter in law came to me and she said, Brother Johnny, I used to deal with uh, a baby when her child was a baby. And she said, then I dealt with a little infant. And then I dealt with a toddler. Then I dealt with a teenager. And then now I'm dealing with an adult. Her daughter now is 24. And she said, I don't like it. It's tough. And I said, Carmen, you don't know anything. I'm talking to my daughter-in-law now. And I said, you don't know anything. You wait till you start dealing with a 24-year-old granddaughter and a daughter-in-law like you. You will have your hands full. I told her that. I did. So why did Jesus say that? Coming to me, all you that labor in a heavy laden? Because he knows the struggles we're going through. And he said, I'll give you rest. We dealt with that Sunday morning. And then last night, we looked at the scripture where he says, 
take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You can't learn about Jesus just by hearing what somebody else has got to say. Now, I like hearing people talk about it. Oh, how blessed I am when somebody gives a testimony of the saving grace of God. What a joy to hear somebody tell of how they were lost in sin and God reached out to them and forgave them of their sin and gave them a, a home in heaven. I like that. But listen, there's some things about Him you don't learn because somebody else told you you got to get in the book yourself. you got to be yoked with Him. And Jesus said, be yoked with me. That means you need to get saved. You say, but Brother Johnny, I, I'll have to give up so much. Listen to me. Listen to me. I am 68 years of age. Judy and I had a marriage retreat in Canada back in February. You know what I told them about 48 couples that came? And I said to them, I am 68, almost 68 years old then. I just turned 68 back the first of this month. And I said, everything on me is either broken or it needs to be fixed or it quit working. But I don't care. I mean this with all of my heart. Chad, I don't want to be 30 again. I, I am tickled to death to be 68 years of age. There is not one, Captain, let me tell you something. This is the beauty of being a child of God. There is not one aspect of my life that I would rather have any other way than as a 68-year-old man. I mean that. I'm happier than I've ever been before in my life. And here's the beauty of being old. The stuff that bothers me, I forget it. So I ain't even got to worry about that. <laughs> So what the Lord said is this. Come unto me, all of you, everyone. And this is the lesson. Your next door neighbor, your uncle, your aunt, your brother, your children. Those that are so wayward and far away from God that you've given up on. You quit doing that. The invitation from Almighty God is to every man, woman, Lord, Lord. He said, come unto me, all of you that labor in a heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Now how do you learn to find that rest? By taking his yoke. First of all, that's by being saved. Sometimes even though we're saved, we get to where we kind of think we're going to handle it. Brother Randy, I remember one year I was teaching the book of Exodus in our winter Bible studies. And I was traveling to New Life Baptist Church. It was about a 90-minute drive. And I was teaching this book for the 14th time in three months. Now, I mean, you've taught it 14 times, uh, you know, almost 14 weeks in a row. So, you know, y'all know what you're talking about after the 14th time. And I was riding along there, and the blessed Holy Spirit of God, Brother Wayne, spoke to my heart and said, Johnny, you had studied. I said, well, Lord, you know, I've been getting ready all, all this time. I've been teaching this. And the Lord said, so you think you can do it? And Brother Father, you know what the Lord said to me? Since you think you can handle it on your own, big boy, that's what I'm going to let you do tonight. I'm going to let you get up and preach on your own. Oh, oh, you're shaking the head, brother. You know what I'm talking about. I got back home that night. Jesus said, how did it go? I said, that's the sorriest preacher I ever heard in my life. I said, it was as dead as 4 o'clock in the morning. She said, what, what do you mean? And I told her what the Lord had done. And then I said, I don't want to try that again. I don't want to try that again. He said, you take my yoke upon you and you learn to me. You know how you learn about Jesus by being yoked with him? He can teach you some stuff. But here's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. What did he say he wanted us to learn of him? Listen to these two things. For I am meek and lowly of heart. Wow. Oh, what does that mean? He didn't say weak. Now the one that said I'm meek and lowly of heart, you remember the Bible said one day he walked up to the tomb and Lazarus had been dead. His sister said, He's been dead. He speaketh. He'd been dead long enough for rigor mortis to set in. And that was intentional because Jesus wanted them to know the evidence of that man being dead. You can even tell by the smell coming out of the tomb. And the Bible says Jesus walked up to the edge of that tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. You know why they said he said, Lazarus, come forth? Because if he had just said, come forth, it might have never died would have come forth. Because God said, come forth. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. You know what Lazarus did? He came forth. When Jesus said, I am meek and lowly of heart, he didn't say weak. Uh-uh. He said, I want you to learn of me. What does he want us to learn about him? He wants us to learn that he is meek and lowly. Now, you know who wrote this? He was the one that was walking down the street one day, and a man said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus turned around and he said, what do you want? He said, uh, that I might have my sight received. Jesus said, you got it. Just turn around and kept on going. That's all it took. 
man blind. Jesus said, you got it. He said, what do you want? He said, that, my, my, that I might be able to see. And Jesus said, you got it. A man with his legs withered, not walk. A man blind from birth in the ninth chapter of the book of John. And the Bible said that he got healed. You know why? Because the one who said, if you'll come to me, I want you to know something about me, Jesus said. Notice what he said. I am meek and lowly of heart. See, what Jesus was saying is this. A lot of people put on the facade. You've been around folks like this. You've been around these kind of people who try to prove something by being something they're not. Go ahead and be you. But we don't like who you think you are. We don't like who you're trying to be. We like you. I mean, just go ahead and be yourself. That's why God made you like that. Right. Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly heart. You know why he said that? He said, I want you to know this is the way I feel. This is not the front I'm putting on. He said, I'm not putting on the show. Jesus said, I want you to know my heart. You know why Jesus came in the first place. Because holy God knew that man couldn't comprehend, comprehend exactly who he was. And so God said, if I go in the form of flesh, man will know exactly what I feel and how I think and how I hurt and how I, what makes me weak. And so he clothed himself in flesh, the Bible says, and came as Emmanuel. That's the purpose of Jesus coming to begin with. To reveal himself to us and to die on the cross and redeem us by his grace. So Jesus said, I want you to know something about me. When I'm telling you to come and learn of me, the reason I want you to be yoked with me, I want you to know that I am meek, and listen to this word, I am meek and lowly of heart. Is it because he's weak? Oh, no. He's the one that spoke the world into existence. He tells the blind to see and the lame to walk and the dead to come forth. And when he himself was dead and chose to come out of the grave, he came out of the grave. He can do anything he pleases. I wonder why he said to us, I want you to know this about me. I am meek and lowly of heart. Oh my. I get so offended at these strutting preachers on television. It bothers me. Um, they'd love for you to worship them. You know what the Bible says about Jesus? The lowly Nazarene. Do, do you know what the smart aleck religious leaders said about our Savior? They said, why he eats with sinners. Indeed he did. They made fun of him. You know they called him a wine bibber and a glutton? They said, you know what they said about him? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? They were saying, hey, nobody can You've been to Katy, Texas. Ain't nothing good come out of Katy, Texas. And I tell people, I'm going to be preaching in Hockley. They say, Ha! Ah, Hockley! Where in the world is Hockley? Never heard a name like that. You know what they said about Jesus? Did anything good come out of Nashville? They, they even, listen, Brother Randy, they even mocked the place where Jesus came from, his home. You know why Jesus said, Come to me, all you that labor and head and laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He said, I want you to know that I am meek and lowly of heart. Why do, you, why do you say that? Some of you are scared to death to get honest with God tonight. Let me tell you what He does with people in the depths of sin. He caught a woman in the Bible in the act of adultery. She was guilty. Because they could not have accused her publicly unless they had two people that had seen the actual act. In other words, they had more than two people who had actually seen this woman committing a sex act out of marriage. And they drug this woman in before Christ and threw her on the ground in front of him. And they said, we caught her in the act of adultery. Now, first thing I want to tell you about this. The reason I know these guys Ain't got a clue about right and wrong. It's kind of evident to me to start off the bat. You know why? Anybody, anybody know why? What do we know about the story automatically? Huh? Where, where's the men? Where's the man that was guilty? I mean, the Bible said they caught in the act. If they caught in the act, there had to be a man involved. Why didn't they bring the man, Brother Wayne, and throw him down? Uh, they didn't want done what was right. I know that off the bat. But we're still going to go over the story since it's in the Bible. It's okay. 
And they threw that woman down in front of Jesus. You know what they, you know what they did? You ever been around these people always quoting the Bible? You better be careful about these people think they can quote the Bible. You know everything about quoting the Bible. They know everything. They know everything. You know what those guys start doing? They said, now Jesus, we won't tell you one thing. Moses said in the law that this woman ought to be stoned. Now, they're talking to the author of the book. <laughs> They're trying to tell the one that wrote the book what he said. They said, Moses, the law said you ought to be stoned. Jesus said, is that right? And then the Bible said, Jesus knelt down on the ground. Started writing something. Now, I know the Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote, but I got a good idea. He started writing down some phone numbers. Now, I know they didn't have phone numbers, 2,000 phones 2,000 years ago, but he's still writing them down. You know what Jesus was doing? He was writing down the phone numbers of some women, these men that were accusing this woman of, some women they had been with. And they wondered how in the world. And Jesus stood back up and he took the stone. He said, y'all got a good idea. So I tell you what. Yeah, the Bible does say she ought to be stoned. And he said, I tell you what. Those of you that's without sin, you go ahead and start killing them. And then he knelt back down and started writing again in the sand, the Bible says. You see, Brother Wayne, the first time he started writing down things that cause these men to think. I told Sam about that woman and he told me he wouldn't tell anybody, but he's told But the next numbers that Jesus started writing in the sand was people that nobody's supposed to know about that these men just only knew about in their mind. And they got to wonder, how in the world does this man know about that? And I've never told anybody about that sin. And you know what happened? When Jesus got up off of his knees, you know how many accusers were present? Zero, not one. Jesus looked at that woman and he said, Woman, where are thine accusers? She said, Well, there's none left. And listen to this. Need, listen to what Jesus said. This is the pure Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb of God that took the sin of the world upon him, that paid all of our sin debt. And the Bible said, Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee. Who do you think you are? Go around judging other people because they don't do things like you think they ought to be done. Who do you think you are? Put down your nose at people because they don't see things like you see. They don't act like you think they ought to act. Who gave you that authority to do that? Show me in the Bible where the Word of God says you got the authority to be judging other people because they don't see things like you do or act like you do. You know what the Bible says? Jesus stood up and he said, I have no condemnation either. He said, oh, well, Brother Johnny, I don't have to, because, man, I live in my sin, and I don't have to be repentant. Uh-uh, wait till you hear the rest of the story. After Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee, listen to what he said, but go and sin no more. I want you to notice this. These men thought you could legislate righteousness. They thought they could beat the devil out of this woman. I tried that before my own children. <laughs> they did. They said this woman was caught in an act of adultery, so we got the answer. Let's just beat the devil out of her. You know what Jesus did? He brought redemption to her. He didn't force her to change her ways. He gave her the incentive by becoming the Lord and Master of her life. And you know how you're going to find victory in your heart tonight? By turning it over to Jesus. A long conversation in the last few days with some people about cell phones. Mom and Dad said, I don't trust my children. I looked at Mom and Dad now and I said, I don't trust me. Brother Glenn, I don't want to be able to see anything on my phone that I don't know Judy can find out what I've been looking at. I don't trust Johnny. He said, Brother Johnny, holding the crap as you are, what would you be looking at? The same thing that you do, I ain't dead. <laughs> right there in that phone, hold that phone up again, cowboy. No, I'm going to tell you something. We don't have any family life anymore. If I'm sitting around with my daughter and her two children, you know what they do? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. 
I kind of like it myself. I tell you what you better do, you better cut that stuff off and start realizing you got a family again. That thing has given us access to more filth and dirt, and sure it could be a, a, a tomb of vessel. I can talk to our staff in the Philippines back and forth. Used to it took me 40 days to get a letter to them and to hear from them. Thank God for the goodness that can be done in it. But I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus said, go and sin no more, He said, I'm going to give you deliverance. I'll bring you deliverance. Last night we talked about the tongue. You know how to get your tongue under control? By turning it over to Him. This is what the Scripture says. Be swift to speak and slow to hear. That's me. Is that what it says? Uh-huh. That's what I do. I walked in the grocery store before Christmas time and I was telling our retired postmaster, he was there with his wife, he said, I brought my list and I've got the list and I brought my wife with me to be sure that I got the right things for Christmas. And I said, well, I didn't bring Judy, but she gave me the list and I probably won't get right because Judy says I have selective hearing, but you know I don't have selective hearing. And there was a black lady over to my side and she said, yes, you do. I said, sister, I never met you before in my life. And you tell me I've got selective here, and how do you know that? She said, because I've been married to a man for 57 years, and every man has selective here. I said, I'll go home and tell my wife. She'll agree with you. <laughs> hey, you know how to control your tongue. God give you control. The Lord's given us a written recipe. He says, be swift to hear. I've got something in my billfold, Brother Randy, that I carry around. And I read it every day as often as I can. And it says, if you're thinking about what you're going to say in reply while somebody's talking to you, you're not listening. And that's me. Brother Wayne, I'm supposed to be a trained counselor, and yet I find myself oftentimes, rather than listening, I'm thinking about what I'm going to tell them. That disqualifies me. You want to know how to control your tongue? Get to Jesus. That's why Jesus said, I, I need the one of your heart. And then we talked about money last night. I know you got money agents, and I know it's difficult nowadays for some. And Jesus didn't say, be yoked to me because I want your money. He, he doesn't need our money. We are the benefactors of giving. Give that it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, overflowing into your bosom. God said, I'll give it. The reason Jesus said, I want you to know I am meek and lowly of heart is because He knows what it is to have needs. You remember the Bible said while our Savior was here that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. Never owned a home the whole 33 years He was here. Born in a stable. Born in a stable. Jesus said, if you'll get yoked with me, you'll find out that I'm meek and lowly of heart. He said, I know what it is to hurt. You know who rejected him? Brother Randy, I know what it is to be rejected. I've been rejected by a lot of different people. But the Bible said Jesus' own people rejected him. One of the saddest things I've ever seen in my life is the first time I went to the Holy Land. I went to the Wailing Wall. A, a, a Gentile can't go there, so I just stand afar off. And I watched men with long flowing white beards walking back and forth as they wrote their phylacteries, their requests for the Messiah to come and stuck them in that wall saying, oh, come Messiah, we've done everything we can, now would you come Messiah? And I stood there way behind them wanting to scream out, fellas, he came 2,000 years ago and you rejected him. The Savior's already come. His own people rejected him, y'all. That's why Jesus said, I want you to know that I am meek and lowly of heart. He said, I know what you're going through. I know what it is to be ostracized, left alone, counted as a nobody. You, you remember what happened when Jesus said, you're going to deny me? Peter jumped up and said, well, I've been looking at John. John might and James might, but I guarantee you I won't. And the only one that Jesus showed how futile his efforts were was the Apostle Peter when he denied him three times. That one that was sometimes closer to Jesus than anybody else denied him three times and said, I don't know. You know what Jesus said, come to me. 
and be yoked to me. He said, I'm meek and lowly. I know what it is to hurt. I know what it is to have the pressure of hurt and pain and sorrow crushed in on me. I've been there. And he said, if you'll join me, just like he told that woman that day, he said, I'll bring forgiveness. Here was a woman caught in the act of adultery. He didn't overlook her sin. He wasn't belittling the sin of adultery. But he was saying, my blood has the capacity of watching and making whole. I remember being at the Southern Baptist Convention some years ago, and there was an ex-prostitute cooker who gave her testimony. And she said, I used to sell my body on the streets for $50 and $75 a trip. She said, the only way I could get money to take care of my heroin addiction was to sell my body. And here's what she said. She said, 10 years ago, I gave my heart to Jesus. And listen to this, she said, I'm not guilty anymore. Amen. She realized, you know what the Bible said God did with her sin? He cast our sin into the depths of the sea and He remembers it no more. That's what the Lord offers you tonight. And Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. The reason He wanted us to be yoked to Him was not that He could browbeat us and knock us into submission, but that we could learn that He is meek and lowly of heart. When your husband doesn't understand you, Jesus does. When your wife doesn't understand you, Jesus does. When mom and dad don't understand you, Jesus does. When your children don't understand you, Jesus does. When everybody's forsaken you, Jesus is there. When everybody mocked you and ridiculed you and walks out on you, Jesus is still there. That's why he said, come and be yoked to me and I'll give you rest. And in taking that yoke, you learn these things about Jesus. He is meek and lowly of heart. Can I share one more thing before we have an invitation? Uh, I was in the Philippines uh, before Brother Randy and Cowboy and uh, Cody were, was with me. And um, it's hot over there. I mean hot. And it was hot as it could be. We were soaking wet. We had about 2,000 people, pastors, sitting there. And I was sitting on the uh, row like where Brother Randy and Miss Nikki are. And they were having the music, and it was coming time for me to preach. And I said, Lord, I don't want to preach. I'm tired. Let one of these other guys preach. I knew I had to preach because I, I, I'm the one supposed to preach. And I said, God, I don't have any preach in me. I got nothing left. Tired, I'm worn out. Y'all, for me to say I don't want to preach, you hear me? I'm tired because I love to preach. <laughs> and so they had the singing service. And when I got up to preach, I preached on the scripture in Proverbs where he said, Go to the ant house slugger, consider her ways, and be wise. Brother Edmund was interpreting for me. And I said to Brother Edmund, who's uh, 25 years younger than I, and I said, Edmund, get. Get ready, because I'm fixed to illustrate to this crowd of 2,000 people what it means to be an ape. I said, are you ready? I said, you, you better hang with me now. And I took off running. And for 10 minutes, I ran all over that congregation of 2,000 people, hollering and shouting. Do you know what an ant does? You ever seen an ant, what they do? They just run, 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 run. Busy, 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 run, 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 run. run. The Bible says they, they, they take food and lay it up for the winter. And I just ran all over. And I got back up to full pit, and Edmund was hassling. 25 years younger than I am. And I got through preaching and I went to my motel room that night. And my crusade coordinator, Brother Van, came to my room weeping. And he said, Brother Johnny, it was three years ago because I was 65 at the time. Brother Van came in my room with tears streaming down his cheek, dropping off his chin. And he said, Brother Johnny, I know that you're 65. And he said, when I stood in the back of that congregation today and saw you preach, I saw a man, 45 years old, preaching with the power of God. Edmund came in sometime later, having not known what Brother Van 
said to me. And Edmund said, weeping, Brother Johnny, today when you stood, I saw a 45-year-old man that I could not even keep up with. He said it was a miracle of God's grace. Now listen to me. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly of heart. He knew what I needed. He knew what I needed. Brother Wayne, I didn't need what, what, what possible in me. I had nothing left. And when I preach, my staff said, Brother Johnny, we were looking at a 45-year-old man. Only Jesus, listen to this man, who is meek and lowly of heart can do that. Whatever your need is tonight, Jesus waits for you to claim that promise. I'm going to ask you to bow your head for just a moment. Father, we come before you again tonight as needy vessels. We don't have any answers except you. And just like that woman taken in adultery, and just like when our physical strength fails and our mental strength fails and our emotional strength fails and our marriages are failing and our children are wayward and our lives are in a wreck, only you can bring healing. Thank you for teaching us tonight to know that you are meek and lowly of heart. You know how to identify with us when we're at the bottom. There are people here tonight who are at the bottom. Help them to know that the reason you died on the cross was to draw them unto yourself and forgive them and give them strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our invitation, I'm going to ask.